you very much, Terry. Uh, I'm Nick Blosser, uh, president of uh, Saliva Group Media. We're publishers of the Sustainable Industries Journal, and there's free copies for people out front. Um, very pleased to introduce Dr. David Orr this evening. To really understand and fully appreciate Dr. David Orr, I think, you need to understand a little bit about his ancestors and his upbringing. For one, Dr. Orr comes from a long line of preachers. His father was a preacher, he has uncles who were preachers, and his grandfather was a preacher. But not only that, his grandfather, the Reverend W.W. W. Orr of Charlotte, North Carolina, offered the christening prayer at the baptism of perhaps the most famous environmentalist of the last 50 years, Rachel Carson, who went on to write the book Silent Spring. In addition, Dr. Orr spent his childhood years in a college town in western Pennsylvania and at a summer cabin in the Allegheny Mountains. As he told a reporter once, his was, quote, an unusual childhood with a lot of time spent in forests and fields. Dr. Orr has said, quote, children raised in ecologically barren settings are deprived of the sensory stimuli and the kind of imaginative experience that can only come from biological richness. It's wonderful to have Dr. Orr in Oregon, a place where nearly everyone still has some strong formative connection to the natural landscape. This connection is probably part of the reason our region become a national leader in the kinds of things Dr. Orr works on, such as green building and sustainable business. Dr. Orr holds a BA from Westminster College, an MA from Michigan State University, and a PhD in international relations from the University of Pennsylvania. He is currently professor and chair of the environmental studies program at Oberlin College. Dr. Orr is perhaps best known for his pioneering work on environmental literacy and his more recent work on ecological design. He raised funds for and spearheaded the effort to design and build the multi-million dollar Environmental Studies Center at Oberlin College, a building selected as one of 30 milestone buildings of the 20th century by the U.S. Department of Energy. He's received awards to numerous dimension, honorary degrees, and is the author of four books, the two most recent being The Last Refuge, The Corruption of Patriotism in the Age of Terror, coming out in two, in next week. Uh, Got to go to Amazon and register for that one. Uh, and The Nature of Design. In addition, the 10th anniversary edition of his book, Earth and Mind, is also coming out this summer. He also serves on the board of the Rocky Mountain Institute. In closing, perhaps the aspect of Dr. Orr that is most rare is the combination of his sweeping understanding of technical details on subjects ranging from biology to construction, and his as complete understanding of the nuances of politics and public policy. It is this combination that makes him so successful, so interesting to listen to, and such a leader. So, please join me in welcoming to Portland this descendant of preachers who was raised in forests fields, and a college town, Dr. David Orr. Thank you, Nick. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. It's really nice to be here. Um, with an introduction like that, uh, we'll proceed straight to the altar call, or uh, I'll just take up an offering. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm sorry Terry was uh, cut short. Terry Bristol has been my host for the past uh, two days, and he's taken me around town. It's one of these things where uh, we'll talk for food. And so uh, I'm well fed and been well, uh, well taken care of here. And Terry, I thank you very much for your hospitality and, and to those of your board of uh, trustees and all of you connected with this work. Portland and Oregon are, as all of you know, very special places in the transition to a world uh, trying to struggle towards something called sustainability, and I want to talk more about that. This place has been a beacon around the world for your innovation and for organizations that have led the way on so many issues. And so it's a real pleasure uh, to be here and to share in that excitement uh, and in this revolution in how we think about the world. Uh, 
Several years ago, just uh, before the events of 9-11, I, uh, I got a phone call from a, uh, a friend in the South that I would known years ago, and he said, David, we'd like to uh, invite you to go to the White House to meet with uh, Dick Cheney and Carl Rove and uh, Gail Norton and Christy uh, Whitman. We're concerned about the lack of environmental responsibility in uh, federal or in uh, White House policies. Imagine that. <laughs> and I said, well, Bo, uh, why me? And he said, well, David, I've known you for a while, and said, you're a sane environmentalist. I'd been called worse, <laughs> but I can't tell you when. So uh, that evening, I uh, thought, well, I, you know, I was a good son. I wanted to crow and to my mother. My mother was 94 years of age, lifelong Republican. I don't, I don't mean a little Republican. She was somewhat out beyond Louis XIV. <laughs> and uh, I said, Mom, i uh, been invited to go with uh, some other folks to meet your friends in the White House. And there was a long pause, and I can't imitate her southern accent, but it was something like, well, David, why you? <laughs> and I said, well, Mom, uh, they think I'm a sane environmentalist. And there was a long pause, and she said, well, honey, they just don't know you like I know you. <laughs> I said, Mom, you're off my Christmas card list. <laughs> the point of that meeting, uh, it was scheduled before the events of 9-11, but the point of the meeting, four of us went to, uh, to meet with people in the White House, and the point was to take a message that all of you know here, and I think understand well, and that is that issues of environment, security, economy, equity, fairness, decency, aren't separable issues. They're not things that we can separate and dice out and deal one with another. They're different facets of one issue, the conduct of the public business. We took the message to the White House. Uh, the meeting was actually held a month after the events of 9-11. We delivered the message uh, when nobody was really home to hear it. Uh, we did meet briefly with Carl Rove and so forth, but, uh, and staff people that, was, uh, that were there, but it was the day, the first day of the bioterrorism alert. Now, the point of that story is, aside to say something about my mother, but the point of the story is that we need to make a new relationship with the earth, a new covenant, if I use religious language. And we need to recognize, and this is the end, this is the take home message I'd like all of you to get. We need to recognize that this is, in fact, one world. And what goes around comes around. And things are linked in all kinds of ways, ironic and paradoxical. And the long term future just isn't all that far off. That this is one world. Second thing I'd like to say is, is this, and this is going to be the heart of the talk I'd like to uh, give you tonight. The second thing is that there are, every culture has a design strategy of how it makes its presence in the world. And there are all kinds of templates for that design strategy. It used to be it was uh, the cosmos and how the cosmos was ordered and our ability to reflect that and imitate that. And then there was an era in which the divine will became the template. And then there was a third design era, I think, that begins with the idea of the invisible hand and the market becomes the, uh, the template. And a fourth era, I hope, is beginning to take root. And that is that life itself is the template, ecological design. So I want to talk about the power of design, and in this case, ecological design, and I'll explain this as, as we go on. Before I uh, get into design, I'd like to look at a couple of design failures. And these are, are very simply. The first one has to do with, with energy. We now import about 53 to 55% of our oil. By the year 2020, that deficit will grow to about 72%. And yet we continue to use oil as if there is no tomorrow. And here's what the design problem is. <laughs> How many of these does Arnold Schwarzenegger own? Is it 17 or whatever? Um, Design issue is, is this, we've gone backwards. What are called the corporate average fuel efficiency standards have in fact gone backwards since uh, 1986. 
we hit a new low last summer. And so in the public mind, design is about coherence. It's about how we make the human presence in the world and how we, how we calibrate the ways in which we provision ourselves with food, energy, water, shelter, livelihood, healthcare, all of these things with how the world works as a physical system. But that's not all. Can you see that uh, graph okay? This is uh, M. King Hubert's uh, methods applied to world oil production. M. King Hubert predicted in 1957 that the discovery of oil in the United States would look like a bell-shaped curve. And by 1970, we would have exhausted half of the available oil States. in the United States. He was uh, right on target. Half of the oil in the United States was uh, exhausted by the year 1970. This is the same methodology applied to world oil production. Now, it doesn't make a lot of difference whether, as some people believe, that the peak year of oil extraction, not production is actually a more accurate word, but the peak year of oil extraction is maybe 2001, 2002, or as Kenneth DeFaze at Princeton, a very famous petroleum geologist, believes, the year 2003. It doesn't make a lot of difference. It could be wrong by half or whatever, but off by a few years, if it's 2005 or 2010, it won't make a lot of difference. We're coming down very near, very soon, on the backside of this oil curve. That's the biggest change of our, our time. So this has been a blast coming up there. That's rock and roll music, that's suburban sprawl, that's uh, fast economic growth, that's fast food joints, uh, that's shopping malls. That's the world we've lived in for a long time. We're about to come down the backside. Now, if you're old enough to remember the Arab oil embargo of 1979, that involved 5% of the US oil supply. Do you remember the effect that the gas pump was to double the price of gasoline, the gas pump? Coming up the left leg of that curve, the world looks linear. Two plus two equals four. Coming down the backside, who knows? It won't be linear. Now, <clears throat> the problem is, and, and you, you all know this, uh, Saudi Arabia, this is the world oil reserves. Saudi Arabia right here is a quarter, give or take, of world oil reserves, Iraq is the next largest body of oil that we know about. That's 10%. We're about 3%. And of course, the problem here is, is this. This is the pattern. And so design is about rethinking, in this particular case, how we use energy, how we provision ourselves with, with fuels. And one way to think about this is, Terry didn't tell me whether I could be political or not, so I'm just, you know. Um, <clears throat> Listen, I've taken out all the bad quotes I could have used. <laughs> They're a lot worse. Uh, Robert Louis Stevenson's comment, sooner or later we sit down to a banquet of consequences. So what are the consequences? Well, this is one of them. Why are we in the Middle East? We're in the Middle, Middle East, not out of the goodness of our hearts, but out of the, the needs of our gas tanks. We're there because we haven't had the wit uh, to develop CAFE standards at work and improve CAFE standards to the level available technology. Uh, we don't have to drive cars to get uh, 15, 18, 20, 22 miles per gallon. And then... <clears throat> well, you, you get the point, do I? I don't need to say anything about that one. Now, that banquet of consequences includes not just involvement in the affairs and politics of a politically unstable region. It involves the militarization of American society. If we're going to drive cars that get 15, 18, 20 miles per gallon, then we've got to go fight for a body of oil, liquid, uh, easily extractable fossil fuels, and that means that we've got to militarize uh, the United States. Our military budget now equals the combined military budgets of the next 21 countries on Earth and there's no sign of that changing. And the banquet of consequences, as all of us uh, are now clearly aware, and I understand that the Pentagon is now somewhat aware of the possibilities of sudden climate uh, change. But this is uh, from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This is the climate record, and it actually goes back uh, from the ice core records, as you know, uh, 440,000 years, and from paleo records, you can take it back another roughly million years or so. But these are the projections for the 21st century. This is that future that's not all that far off. And projections from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change range from 
temperatures of around 2 degrees Fahrenheit to upwards of 10.4 degrees Fahrenheit, or roughly just a bit under 6 degrees centigrade. That's a projection that has no surprises built into it. It makes no assumptions about the release of methane from seabeds or uh, tundra or anything else. This is simply extrapolating from the present future, and not a far distant future. This is well within this century. Now, 10.4 degrees Fahrenheit is hell. And the theory that we operate under is that you can turn the thermostat of the world up and nothing else wobbles over here. But that's not the world we read about in the evening uh, paper or see on the news. That world is a world where small changes have large effects. So energy policy and ecological design. This is a design disaster. Let me turn to a second one. This is the advertisement for Archer Daniel Midlands. And the, the prose here, which you can't read, but I've got off to the, the right-hand side of the screen. What if we looked at the world as one giant farm field? Now think of that as a design solution. And as a design solution, that is one size fits all kind of thinking about agriculture. Um, it is a category mistake of confusing uh, industrial metaphors and biological systems. But this is what we've done on that, uh, that theory, that design template. We've taken the Midwest of the country and turned it into a vast protein factory. We've rearranged the landscape of uh, most of the Midwestern part of the country, sucked the Ogallala half dry, the Ogallala aquifer, which underlies uh, this part of the central part of the United States down to central Texas. Uh, it was a body of water at its uh, maximum, about the size or volume of Lake Huron, or a bit larger. So we've sucked the aquifer half dry. We've converted the ecosystems of the Midwest of the country into a vast protein factory. We ship that protein to feedlots out here in the West, and some of the feedlots will slaughter as many as 30 to 50,000 cows per day. And <clears throat> with all the ecological implications of that, you can't have confinement feeding without lots of antibiotics. And so I teach a generation of young people who, by EPA estimates, have 190 organochlorine compounds in their fatty tissues and bloodstream that don't belong there, many of them from the food system and part of from this system. And then the consequences, this banquet of consequences from designing systems the wrong way include not just uh, soil runoff, which you can see here in a NASA picture. This is the, the Gulf of uh, Mexico, and this is the Mississippi River, but also a dead zone off the mouth of the Mississippi River, roughly the size of the state of New Jersey. And this area, this dead zone, this anoxic area in 1950 was about half of the commercial fisheries of the United States. It's now effectively dead. And then you get the design of things wrong, and you begin to see things like this epidemic of obesity, this agricultural slash food system. And this is obesity. This, uh, these two slides are taken from the uh, Centers for Disease Control Studies of Obesity. This is uh, two years old. Uh, this is for a uh, body mass index uh, that would put people into the uh, obese category. A quarter of America is now not just overweight, but obese. That is a food system, and then not the least of this is a lot of cultural confusion about food. <laughs> this is not a fake slide. This, these two billboards uh, came up about uh, eight miles from where I lived, and there was something of a traffic jam while I got uh, pictures of them. <laughs> and of course, that isn't the end of it. So bad design isn't just a biophysical or technological phenomenon, it's also a mental phenomenon. And it doesn't stop there. We can make a long list of design failures. It takes us 3,200 pounds of waste materials to put one pound of product on a store shelf. The food system invests about 11 calories or more of fossil energy to put one calorie on our plate. And this security system that makes us anything but secure requires us to spend $11,000 per second, that $400 billion defense budget. Now, <clears throat> design. 
this search for order begins with a belief that the world really is ordered, that matter and energy are ordered, and that order matters. It's important to us to find order in some way to create a human presence in the world that is fair and decent and sustainable and just. The four approaches to design listed on this particular slide, the old approach of trying to find order somehow in the cosmos, in the stars or uh, divine readings of one sort or another, and then the will of God or the will of divinity, and then uh, the search for order within markets, invisible hands, and then finally into ecology and biology. And so this search for order, we've littered the planet with uh, lots of different uh, formations, pyramids. This is a photograph I took at Stonehenge a few years ago, uh, an astronomical observatory. Uh, about the same time in, in history, uh, you find all over most of the uh, uh, world ruins that were vast uh, megaliths or burial monuments of one kind or another. This is taken from, photograph taken from one of my Mycenae. The Greeks contributed a view of order as mathematical, looking at relationships of things and golden means and ratios of one thing or another. This is a slide taken of Epidaurus in uh, the Greek theater. You can drop uh, a quarter on a stone located right about here in the center of the stage area and you can hear it clearly like a bell at the top row of this very large theater. The Greeks helped us understand that order was part of a mathematical relationship of phenomena. Design in our time has become a euphemism or synonymous with just whatever you can make to sell. And so this is a recent cover of Newsweek magazine. And so design in this sense is how you make things that you can sell that create profit for a company or whatever, but how you can bamboozle the public by changing the color, changing the contours, changing the geometry of an object. Ecological design, as I would like to use it, is very different. If design is about making things, ecological design is about making things that fit in a social and cultural context. And the principles are things that we all know. Nature becomes the standard for design. That 3.8 billion years of evolution becomes a textbook, not something to overcome, but something to learn from. A set of limits around us as well. Design principles include protect diversity, both cultural and ecological account for all the costs. One of the problems of our civilization is that we push this bow wave of cost ahead of us, off onto future generations, or we offload costs on other parts of the world and other peoples. Designed for whole systems. The late Danella Meadows is one of the most articulate people I've ever heard on this subject. But instead of designing components, you're designing entire systems. Think of what ecological design would mean for the design of that food system. If, in fact, the template for a food system was health, capital H. And then the use of current sunlight. We're in a transition era where we got to make this fast, rapid, forced march from the fossil fuel era to an era powered by current sunshine. We've got to disinvent fire. We've got to remove five billion tons of carbon from our energy budget. And then as Bill McDonough and others have written for a long time, we've got to eliminate waste. Not, the, not just recycle waste, not just downcycle materials, but eliminate the very concept of waste. And the pattern is all there. Emerson once said that we live in the lap of great intelligence. And that intelligence is embodied on the planet in all kinds of ways, where nature becomes the standard for what we do and how we think. Uh, the design template built into the way this world has evolved. This is one example. This is a termite mound. And termites somehow, without degrees in engineering or architecture, as far as we know, can keep a mound like this at a constant temperature of about 86 degrees. And termites apparently know when to open certain holes in this mound and when to close them. That's all kind of an intelligence. Janine Benyus takes the, uh, the word biomimicry further. And Janine, in a wonderful book simply called Biomimicry, describes how spiders take sunshine and dead flies and make materials five times stronger than steel. And you think about that. Made at ambient temperature, no toxic chemicals, biodegradable, made at or near the body, biomimicry. A level of productive efficiency and ingenuity that exceeds our best engineering by orders of magnitude. The design revolution is happening, in large part or in some ways because of what you all have done in Oregon, in so many ways, uh, transit-oriented urban development. Uh, the lower right-hand photograph is uh, 
actually taken from Baltimore, Maryland. This is typical of uh, America, but there is a revolution beginning to build across the cities of the country. The work of John Todd is important in this sense. I love this quote from John, elegant solutions predicated on the uniqueness of place. One size doesn't fit all. It will never fit all. To begin to look at their places as sources of instruction and limits and places to be honored. This is some of John's work in waste management, where John takes a waste stream and turns out pure water and a variety of different products, whether it's fish or flowers or fuels. This is a uh, zero uh, carbon development in London called simply BedZed. Uh, a middle-class housing development, uh, pioneering green design in, in architectural design. You've got a lot of this kind of work going on in Oregon. There's a good bit of it going on through the uh, U.S. Green Building Council and the various affiliate chapters. There's a revolution in distributed energy now with wind and photovoltaics and microturbines and fuel cells. Could we power this country by sunlight efficiency in a distributed energy system? Sure we could. We don't lack for the technology. We don't even lack for the economics. We lack government leadership on this issue. <laughs> we set out in 1995 to design a building on our campus called the Adam Joseph Lewis Center. This is the completed, uh, uh, or part of the uh, near completion of the building. Uh, this uh, work began on this in 1995, construction began in 1998, we moved in in the year 2000, but one of our goals was to design a building, that the standard for which was drinking water in, drinking water out, powered as much as you can power buildings in uh, northern Ohio, cloudy northern Ohio, by current sunlight. Next year this building will be powered Entirely. by sunlight. Uh, this is one of the two photovoltaic arrays we're building right now, we're planning a, a second large array for this structure, but uh, this is the roof of the, uh, that particular building. Our energy performance compared to other buildings looks uh, like this. This is the average for uh, new classroom office buildings of which this is a model. Uh, this takes about 90, the average takes about 90,000 British thermal units or BTUs per square foot to heat, ventilate, light, and air condition. So every square foot requires 90,000 British thermal units and a BTU is the amount of energy it takes to raise a pound of water one degree Fahrenheit. This is our net energy performance uh, with this building. This is technology now five or six or seven years old, or even in some cases a bit older. Could you design buildings that are powered entirely by sunshine? And the answer now is yes. Could you do that in a cost-effective way? The answer again, I think, is, is yes. And then there's the hydrogen economy, trying to get born, where we use contemporary technology converting sunlight by either wind or photovoltaics or other methods uh, under development now uh, into hydrogen. I uh, remember that day you almost blew up the high school lab with hydrogen uh, and then convert hydrogen back into electricity. The hydrogen economy uh, is, is coming along the way. Now, <clears throat> all of that, all that is design, mostly about technology, mostly about things and artifacts and how we arrange these in the world. Could we design better food systems? Sure. Could we design better energy systems? Absolutely. Could we design better production systems? Sure. Now, the question is why haven't we done that? And I'd like to make a transition here from design of things and design of systems to design of political systems. How do we design a culture, a society, and a political system that is capable of doing ecological design? I think this is on Thomas Jefferson's mind a bit, as much as it could have been for somebody who lived in the, the 18th century. But this, of course, is Monticello. And of all the things that Jefferson did in life, uh, Secretary of State, uh, President of the United States, uh, Jefferson's proudest achievements on his tombstone were he was the author of the Declaration of Independence, author of the Statute of Virginia, uh, Religious Freedoms in Virginia, and author or the founder, founding father of the University of Virginia, all design objects. His plan for education, this is his drawing for this, what he called the academical village. became the University of Virginia. And Jefferson envisioned this relationship. This is the, the lawn, what was called the lawn, and this is housing for professors and faculty members uh, and students beginning to mingle. Jefferson had a pedagogy, a philosophy of education, and also design. And that is the, uh, what, uh, uh, the library that stood at the head of that, uh, that system. Now this was all for Jefferson a way to begin to think about democracy, 
to educate a citizenry for leadership in the country. And begin to think about the interplay of architectural design with the design of minds capable of maintaining a democratic society. And he said, if we ever fail to be informed about, about things, the object was not to take power of government from the people, but to inform their discretion, a design object. And this is his tombstone uh, at Monticello, in which he enumerated those three great things that, of which he was the designer. And so I want to stray into politics here as a design science. What does ecological design have to do with politics? And how do we design a political system that is capable of supporting the redesign of this culture, this transition towards sustainability? And I'd like to make a point. The numbers on the, the screen behind me are about public opinion. We don't suffer from a public that doesn't want to move towards solar energy. That's not the issue. This is data that comes from CNN, USA Today, and Gallup Poll Services. And you find the same numbers crop up with some variation year after year. Should the public invest, should we as a government invest in solar and wind power? 91% say yes. Efficient appliances, 87% yes. Efficient buildings, 86% yes. Efficient cars, 85% yes. Now, some of you will be thinking, well, sure, that's what they say, but that's not what people will do. And indeed, that is the truth in many cases. And the point is that the slide divides us. It shows this geologic fault line between us as consumers, we Walmart, because we want the lowest prices, and our role as citizens, the difference between I and we. And for a long time now, for at least 25 or 30 years, we've been told that government is the problem, government's the problem, we've got to get government off our backs. The word I, predominant, not the word we. What's the collective decision-making mechanism here? And it will be government. And I'd like to suggest that the machinery that ought to connect popular opinion, public will, with public policy is broken. Our energy policy? <laughs> We've had to sue our government to find out who was at the table that made the energy policy of the Bush-Cheney administration. We've had our language corrupted. Since when did the word patriot come to mean people in an SUV sporting two American flags and a God Bless America bumper sticker driving to the mall? That's not patriotism, my friends, that's self-indulgence. And since when did the word conservative apply to people willing to run the risks of permanent destruction of the planetary systems? That's not conservative. That's not even reckless. We don't have a word yet that describes those people. And the word liberalism, do you remember that debate, if you're old enough, you remember the debate in which Dukakis, uh, Michael Dukakis was debating the first uh, George Bush and George Bush had turned to the caucus and accused him of the L word. Do you remember that? Do you remember how you just kind of, if, you're, if you identify yourself as a liberal, you just kind of hung on the edge of your seat. You wanted Mike and time just sort of stood still. You wanted Michael Dukakis to say, yeah, I'm a liberal and I'm proud of it. And here's what that word means. Do you remember that? And he backed up. No, I'm not really a liberal and uh, I'm against taxes and so forth and so on. You wanted him to say, do a clinic, a political philosophy clinic. This is what the word means. This is why I'm proud to be a liberal. Now, in fact, <clears throat> politics aren't liberal and conservative. Every mature person, politically, is a little bit of both and all of the above and, and some other qualities as well. And some issues will be liberal, some issues will be conservative, uh, some issues were someplace else, but you no one. I mean, what's Limbaugh? purported drug uh, abuser, being now defended by the American Civil Liberties Union? Is he liberal or is he conservative? I don't know. What would you call him? But in fact, the liberal conservative dichotomy, I think, is a phony way to think about politics. And the founders of this country worried about this because they saw themselves executing a design science. How do you design a republic that can last over a long period of time? So the slide behind me simply depicts a different way to think about politics. It isn't left and right, my friends. It is present and or present versus the future. It isn't left and right. 
Uh, it's what we do in relationship to the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh generation out. We're seven generations from Thomas Jefferson. If we look back on him, see the warts and flaws and all, what will people seven generations out from us think about our generation? Did we get it right or did we not? And then you begin to look at this in a little bit deeper way. Thomas Jefferson, the founder of what we take to be our radical politics, Jefferson was always in debt and worried about debt. And Jefferson's, uh, in, in the quote on the, the screen behind me, in this famous letter to James Madison in 1789, said, you know, no generation has the right to impose debt on future generations. A year later, Edmund Burke, in this uh, famous wonderful book called uh, Reflections on the Revolution in France, uh, said roughly the same thing. He saw the current generation as a trustee midway between a distant past and distant future. And for Burke, a conservative, the founder of modern conservatism, the role of government, the role of politics was to pass on, as he put it, an entailed inheritance of uh, culture and institutions and organizations, civil society, from the distant past to the distant future. Change one thing with Jefferson. Change the idea that debt could be ecological and economic. And that's a change Jefferson, were he here now, would agree to. Change one thing with Burke. That an entailed inheritance isn't just institutions and culture, but it's the ecological on which any culture rests. Clean air, forests, land, biological diversity, functioning ecosystems. That's a change I think Burke would agree to were he here now. And you begin to see this historic convergence of left and right. It isn't about liberalism and conservatism. You can be for sustainability effectively from either of those positions. It's about present and or present versus the future. And then there's this issue. The founding fathers, in thinking about the organization of the country, didn't know what corporations were. There were chartered organizations, but nothing like contemporary corporations. And it wasn't until roughly 1886 in the uh, Santa Clara County decision versus uh, Union Pacific that the personhood of corporations changed dramatically. In this purported decision, the Supreme Court said that corporations have the legal rights of persons. Now, you and I are persons. We die, we're mortal, we have limited assets, we can be one place uh, at a time and not multiple places. Corporations are anything but human. And to say that they ought to be protected by the same uh, freedoms that are built or vouchsafed to us in the Bill of Rights is simply ludicrous. The corporations have the rights of freedom of speech, on, on and on. Turns out, under closer examination by Thomas Hartman and other scholars, that in fact the Supreme Court never said this. This was described in the headnotes of the decision written by the clerk to the court, himself an attorney. But the justice involved, the Supreme Court justice involved in this case, apparently never said this. This was not part of the decision, but it was a part of the decision that would echo down through time as something of a mistake. And then there's this issue of money. This is the, uh, the last presidential election. The founding fathers would have had no understanding of the role money has played in American politics in the last 35 or 40 years. This is simply the contributions. Last uh, time around, George Bush had $190 million to spend. Al Gore had $130 million to spend, and there's a difference there. But the point is, we get the best politics money can buy. And instead of campaign finance reform, we need campaign finance overhaul. We need the same separation that we purportedly have between church and state, a point I want to come to in just a minute. We need the same separation between money and politics that we purportedly have between the church and the state. Money should not be in politics. We will pay one way or another for elections. We pay, we might as well pay up front and pay openly. So money has no role in the selection of President of the White House. This is the famous uh, red-blue map uh, taken from the New York Times right after the uh, uh, election of 2000. And I want to point out a couple things about this map. We are an increasingly divided country. That comes as no news to, to anyone here. We're divided partly because our language has failed us, partly because our understanding of politics has failed us, uh, partly because of the lack of leadership, but we've got a lot of work to do. We've got to reach out across these boundaries, both geographical and ideological and also class boundaries. One of the problems we've had in American politics is this one. I hope this slide shows up. This is taken from the Atlantic Monthly, but this is the 18th district in Pittsburgh after it was gerrymandered around to eliminate a Democrat, uh, Democratic congressman. And that's an interesting way to shape an electoral district. 
This is the result in Congress. These are the declining number of actually competitive seats in Congress. And so we're told now that in the election of 2004, only 79 seats in Congress are legitimately competitive. 79 seats. Now, we have a winner-take-all political system. And so this means that if you are in a safe seat, either as a Republican or as a Democrat, you can do the most outlandish things. You can take the most outlandish stands on various kinds of issues, and you never have to move toward the center. This is a huge design mistake. We'll need to rethink how we organize our political affairs and the conduct of electoral business in this country. And the separation of church and state. I don't want to, if, if you're a Republican and a supporter of the president, I don't want to insult you, but I do want to make the same point the founders made and make it a bit more emphatically. We have a constitutional amendment against the joining of the powers of state and the powers of religion. It was there for good reason. The founders took this very seriously. It's right at the head of the Bill of Rights. They took this very seriously, and we can say 200 years and some later that we know we have no good case where the power of state and the power of religion were joined anywhere to good effect. This is a division that should always be made ironclad, with no exceptions. And then there is this issue of freedom of press. And the Founding Fathers, these great designers of democracy, when they came to the press, they gave it special attention. Freedom of the press was important. It was not to be trampled with. The press is now, as all of you know, is increasingly concentrated in fewer and fewer hands, with the results that a quarter of the radio stations or a bit more are owned by one company. That is, under the current FCC uh, guidelines, will increase. It could increase dramatically. Uh, control of newspapers increasingly concentrated, so our news, our information, this lifeblood of democracy is increasingly controlled by people who have little or no concern for democracy. And James Madison said it as well as it could be said, a popular government without information or the means to acquire it is either a prologue to a farce or a tragedy or perhaps both. And we're seeing that begin to occur. I don't know where you get your news, but if you get your news from Fox, you don't know much that's accurate. After uh, just before Christmas, in a uh, Gallup poll of Fox uh, News viewers, 70% of them reported that they thought weapons of mass destruction, these elusive weapons of mass destruction, had in fact been found in Iraq. If I remember the number correctly, half of them, them believed that they'd actually been used against U.S. troops. Fox News. Now, we're a people that's defined by a past. That past was shaped by people who understood, and I think would have understood in the current time, what ecological design was all about. This effort to design a culture that would last democratically. We were designed by, or we were shaped by, a Declaration of Independence that said all men are created equal. It took us a long time to understand those words, and we're still working at it. A constitution that embodied that philosophy, attached to that a Bill of Rights, it gave us the rights that no people in the history of this earth have ever vouchsafed to them. And the Gettysburg Address, which was the culmination, culminating statement of a war carried out to give, give real meaning to that belief that men, in fact, are created equal. We're being redefined by four documents, unless we choose otherwise. The Bush versus Gore Supreme Court decision in the year 2000 for which the Supreme Court intervened in a state electoral process and said that this law cannot apply ever again to anybody. Now, law, by definition, is to apply across the board. It's about generalities. This was specific law. We're being redefined by public policies, for example, Cheney's Energy Plan, which we're having to sue the government to find out who, in fact, was at the table. We're being redefined by something called the Patriot Act, which most congressmen admitted they never read, 
which virtually eliminates whole sections of two of the Bill of Rights. And a national security plan, if you haven't read it, read it. It allows us or gives the president the right to declare war on any country deemed to be a competitor. Not any country that's attacked us, but any country that he deems to be a competitor and a danger. <laughs> now, looking ahead, the design challenges grow more steeply. Topography gets steeper and more treacherous. We're in a century where we've got to eliminate 5 billion tons of carbon. That's not, that's not my estimate. That's, in fact, the, the numbers that come from good science. We've got to stop the hemorrhaging of species. We've got to learn how to grow our food and fiber sustainably. And you go down, let your eyes go down that list, and you get to the, the very last item. We've got to figure out how we are going to deal fairly with the distribution of wealth within and between generations and across boundaries of countries. Uh, without offloading our ecological or social or cultural costs on someone else. We've got to understand where we fit in this larger world. We've got design challenges like no culture ever had. This design revolution which is underway in places like Portland and all over Europe and parts of the United States and the Far East, this design revolution is the start of a vast sea change in the way we make the human presence in the world and how we provision ourselves of food energy, water, materials, livelihood, health care, shelter, entertainment, all of these things. Aldo Leopold, one of my favorite authors, uh, author of Sand County Almanac, and you're actually looking at the shack where Leopold wrote uh, parts of that book. Leopold laid it down in this way. Our job as homo sapiens is to make this transition from the conqueror of the land community to plain member and citizen of it. Design, ecological design, this fourth great design revolution is about how we rethink the human presence in the world to become citizens and plain members of that biotic community of which we are and have been a part for 100,000 or more years. Back to the opening story. What we tried to say at the White House is that this, in fact, is one world. Things are connected in often ironic and strange and paradoxical ways. What goes around surely comes around, and violence everywhere in all of its forms, violence domestic, violence against nature, violence against other nations, preemptive violence is wrong and will ultimately be self-defeating, and the long term just isn't that far off. Thank you. Where is I do? There you go. Okay, go ahead. Going back to the slide that you showed, uh, showing uh, support um, in a lot of polls for people, for all of us to move towards where, a, Can I interrupt? Where are you? I'm over here, <laughs> towards stage, oh, all right. right, left, whatever. Um, <laughs> according to the polls, it looks like a majority of the population is in favor of moving towards this more ecological design. So for what reason are we not, are, we're not doing that right now. I mean, when you presented this evidence, why don't they say, oh, of course, we should do this? I mean, what is the point of continuing in an oil economy? <laughs> I just want to be silent long enough to let those words kind of ricochet across the audience. Uh, there's no point remaining in an oil economy. We've got to get out of the fossil fuel economy as fast as sensible public policies can move us. And the, th this isn't... Um, this isn't just a matter of smart foreign policy. This, this, in fact, is a matter of ecological imperative. We cannot burn fossil fuels with impunity any longer. We know too much now. We're at 375 uh, parts per million carbon uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, we've never been here before, not, not since we've been on, on the Earth, not since Homo sapiens has been here. Um, let me just say two things very quickly in response. I tried to show five or six different ways in which this design revolution, in fact, is taking place, and it is. It's taking place very rapidly. Is it rapid enough relative to the magnitude of the challenges we face? No, not at all. Uh, but is it taking place? Yes. Uh, U.S. Green Building Council, uh, uh, one example of it in terms of the built environment, 
uh, technological innovation in areas of photovoltaics and fuel cells and microturbines and wind technology. It, this is not a technological issue. You're asking why is it not taking place faster? The best answer I can give, my view is it's a failure, a total, total failure of public policy at the highest levels of government. This, if, <clears throat> you, you, we can't speak for future generations. Uh, you know, now since I step away from the lights, I can see all of you up there, that, that's interesting. Uh, I just feel in a place like this like I ought to sing something. Uh, <laughs> The um, future generations will look back, I think, at this generation as derelict. If we do not move rapidly toward an energy efficient, solar powered future, they will have words for us like the words or the thoughts we have toward the people who own slaves in US history. We look back at uh, slave owners and how could they have done this? They will look to us and say, how could they have done this? The conditions of slavery could be manumitted. You could free slaves, you could buy them or fight wars or whatever, but you could free them. The conditions of climate change that we leave behind will not be changeable. They'll apply to all people for all time as far as we measure time. Um, anyway, I, I think this is a, a government failure. Uh, let, me, let me go over here. Can you hear me? Uh, my question is, why didn't you run for president? I did. You didn't see me? <laughs> well, uh, thank you for that. I, let me go over here. Up here? In the uh, interest in moving to a hydrogen economy, uh, the World Resource Institute is supposed to have a report out very soon talking about how many acres of wind farm uh, you know, space was needed to power one hydrogen fuel cell. And apparently it's a lot. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you knew uh, which was the most efficient way or most hopeful way to move toward for making the, I know that the present federal hydrogen plan is to be 98 or 99 percent powered by fossil fuels to make the hydrogen yeah. for the new car, right? So, do you have any idea uh, which is the best approach for hydrogen? Um, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll no, also, I, I'm I also ready. wonder if, you're, if you could extend your activism to um, the, our voting machines and whether you have had any design thoughts about that. <laughs> Do you know what I mean, the uh, computer voting? Okay, voting for the next uh, hour or so, I'd like to... Uh, yeah, that, that's not a simple issue. On, on hydrogen, here's, here's I think what's going to happen. Uh, last year in Science Magazine, there's some question about uh, the effects of hydrogen uh, leaks and uh, there's a big issue here because it's the link to climate change. Uh, the second item here. The thing we can do for hydrogen uh, power, say vehicles or whatever, is to use standard fossil fuels and then something that's called a reformer on board the vehicle and then you strip off everything but the hydrogen. Uh, but that doesn't get us very far. The source of hydrogen really, in my judgment, ought to be solar generated. Now, I want to make two comments. There are a lot of technical details here I'm not really equipped to answer, and I think this will, uh, we'll be discussing this and researching this for quite some time, but two, two comments. One is, there is no magic bullet. I wish there were. There isn't. Uh, if you look at the, what's called the energy return on investment, the amount of energy it takes to get energy, when Spindletop came in uh, in Houston, it took one unit of energy or a bit less to turn out 100 units of energy. So the investment and the return on investment was one to 100. With photovoltaics, it may be, uh, gee, I don't know, uh, maybe one to three, one to four, one to five maybe. With wind power, roughly the same ratio, give or take, depends on where and what kind of technology. So we're coming off the top of that Hubert curve where the energy return on investment was absolutely incredible. We're coming down to a very different energy future. And we'll have to learn how to use energy very efficiently. And the good news here is the technology is moving us in that direction. The average refrigerator 15 or 20 years ago used 1,750 kilowatt hours of electricity. The best on the market now is, if I get the number correctly, it's about 200 to 250 kilowatt hours of electricity per year. So we're, we're getting better. But that's not going to be good enough. My second comment, and the last comment on this is, ecological design isn't a panacea. 
All it does, all it does, is to buy us time. And then for a species that's pleased to call itself Homo sapiens, the question here is, time for what? What do we do with that time? And design buys us some time, but the, the real issues for us, and I think out of the last uh, slide or so with Aldo Leopold, how do we become plain members and citizens of the biotic community? How do we relate to each other? How do we learn to love each other, care for each other? How do we do those things that, that stretch that love and that care out as far into the future as the founding fathers seven generations did for us? The good judgment, the care, the love, the compassion. And that's designed, buys us some time to think about those issues. But boy, it sure is no magic bullet. But thanks for that question. That, that, that was a good question. I appreciate that. And there, there are a lot of technical issues here. Oh, voting machines. Um, voting machines, just be careful. Keep a record, keep your, keep your receipts. Uh, yeah, we're, yeah. Um, we have a lot of students and teachers up here, and I was wondering if you could comment on what would be good careers for the future for these young people in the audience. Oh, that's just so exciting. Uh, number one, first advice, uh, do not have, do not have a career. Have yourself a life. Find something, find something that you love to do. Find a way to write your autobiography against the topography of this age, with all its dangers, all its opportunities. Find a way to write your autobiography in a way that really is meaningful to you and makes a big difference on the earth. And you can do that in all kinds of ways. You can take the word environment and you can attach it to virtually any other career area. You want to be in business? Uh, environmental business is a booming field right now. It ought to boom a whole lot more. But people like Ray Anderson has been a real beacon in that, in that area. You want to go into medicine, environmental medicine, environmental health is a huge and growing field. Uh, your time, the best I can tell you is that your time, for those of you who are, are students here, is a time like the, uh, the Chinese symbol for crisis that mingles opportunity and danger. I've talked some about the dangers. Turn the coin over, there are opportunities, incredible opportunities. And I would put them all some way or another in relationship to the ecological design movement. Designing houses that are powered by sunlight, to use no toxic materials, designing zero discharge urban areas, uh, designing pro that have long-term value. I mean, the, the excitement is there, but uh, don't. Whatever you do, don't have a career. You, you, can, you, can get a, you can get a career in a calling, but if you start out trying to have a career first and assume you'll find a calling later, it doesn't work very well. See, the preacher comes out real quickly. Calling is a Presbyterian word. Thank you. Yeah.